Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special bonus episode of Procedurally Generated. This here is the full interview that I did with George Barry that I referenced in episode two of PG. George is the CEO of Team Woodsalt and the creator of the game. Quick heads up, George was gracious enough to record this conversation as my software was not letting me do it. Uh, so thank you so much, George, but it did only capture his half of the conversation. So I recorded the questions that I asked and some of the things that I remember we, we, we went back and forth on. I'm trying to splice them together into a pretty natural, try to make a natural conversation. Uh, I did my best. I'm sorry. I'll do better next time in that regard. Uh, but I'm still really happy with how this interview came out. Um, also, there is some strong language in this. So viewer discretion uh, is advised. Um, but without further ado, let's jump in. Hello, George. Let's dive right in. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me. My first question has to do with the availability of the game. Now, I bought it and I played it on Steam, but it originally released on the Switch. Now, if I go look for the game, though, on the Nintendo eShop, it's nowhere to be found. Why is that? Um, okay, so it came out uh, when, it, when it released. Basically, we had quite a, quite a strong lead up to it. Um, so we reached out to a few different publishers. Um, I say a few, we actually reached out to about 20 to 30. Um, but one of many stumbling blocks, ugh, stumbling blocks is my fault, one of my own personal failings when it came to this was I never quite settled on um, an elevator pitch. So when it came to describing the games to people, um, especially those that would be interested in publishing it, I'd sit there for about five minutes and explain it um, because I couldn't decide if it was an adventure game, um, a visual novel, if it's, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so we went the self-publishing route and instead we went with a um, PR company. And unfortunately, that PR company um, was struggling due to COVID. And about two weeks before launch, uh, they basically told us that they had to let our contract go in order to focus on some of the larger projects so it kind of released to a wet fart essentially um so while we had quite a lot of interest in the run-up and you know we had a bit of a discord going on um when it came out it didn't sell many copies at all i'd probably estimate uh i'd, I'd take a pun at 500 it's probably not even that um, mostly because right when it was supposed to release, when it's really important to get that sort of movement going the two weeks before that, um, it just disappeared. So we didn't have any reviewers looking at it except for some people that um, were independent and focused on that. So what we did when we looked at it and a few months went on, we're just like, we're going to have to wipe our face with this a bit and just realize the situation that we're in. Um, and so we made the decision to sort of take it off the stores with the intention um, of taking what we had learned, what the positives and negatives were um, from reviewers. Um, and then I sort of put together a bunch of documents, uh, basically looking at what were the most common complaints and the most common um, things that they liked. And then doing a sort of time uh, benefit, cost benefit ratio analysis on that to work out what we can add and what we can remove in order to make a better game. Um, and so the idea was to remove it from the stores um, and still allow people that had already bought it to download it. Um, and so I've always kept my um, my inbox open. So if anybody ever asks, I would just give them a, an EXE of it. Um, but that, ne that never happened. So yeah, we we decided to take it down with the idea that we would do a Redux version where we would basically add um, what one of the main complaints was the middle of the story. There was kind of a lull that kind of goes from a lot happening in the beginning and then just sort of pottering about in the middle and then a lot's happening at the end and the sort of middle chunk was a bit, uh, a bit lacking um so the plan was to do a bunch of new endings that could get in the middle and some new endings at the end um also changing things like there was a lot of complaints about the size of the heads <laughs> so i went through and personally resized all of the heads um 
your complaints about the music. So um, I started to do some more of the music myself because beforehand I um, asked a friend of mine, uh, paid a friend of mine to do it. Um, so lots of little stuff like that. But sort of as time went on, the money that came in wasn't enough to fix these issues. And I wasn't willing to ask people that worked on it to work on it for free. Um, and I personally didn't have the money to do it, and the people that invested in it, um, like they they were willing to sort of say, oh, let, let's leave it alone, because they actually get tax breaks um, when it doesn't succeed, um, which is bizarre. Also explains why a lot of shitty movies are released, because that's actually a way of um, tax, av tax avoidance. Tax avoidance is legal, I think, I can't remember. So um, it kind of got to the situation where I wanted to do something more with it and sort of make it a better game for everyone um, with the intention of it being like a full re-release. Um, but anybody that had bought the game previously would get this um, version for free anyway. Because uh, 500, 500 copies is basically a drop in the bucket compared to what we needed to sell in order to pay off would sell some fund the next one uh which would have to be around thirty thousand. so you know what's that one sixtieth so you know these people supported us at the beginning um they're involved and they continue to be involved and they're a good little community we had going um so i wanted to sort of keep that going and sort of repay that um with this and that's that's still the intention but we're what two years down the line now um and it's still very much a, a question of how to do it. Because essentially, we worked out that we only need about, I say only, about £15,000 to do everything that we want to do. Um, because one of the issues is when you resize all the heads, for example, then you need to redo all the cutscenes because all the cutscenes have the old size heads in it. Um, so you're going to end up with, you know, normal um, ratioed people in the game, but suddenly... In every cutscene, everyone's got massive brain tumors, apparently. What are we talking for head shrinkage? Are we talking 50%, maybe a little off the top? What did I... I think it was actually, like... Uh, it's weird, I remember, like, the, the number I had to type in. I think it was, like, a reduction of 30%, which it is quite a bit so it's still like stylized but nowhere near as much as much more sort of in line with what you'd expect rather than what i uh accidentally or inevitably um commissioned was like dk mode on every character um which you know was my fault like the 3d artist showed it to me i was like yes <laughs> so that that's on me um so yeah, there's there's also you definitely notice the difference. Um, so the result is I'm still a fifty percent shareholder in the company, and I said like, well, I'm willing to sell off huge chunks of my ownership just to get this thing done and properly out the door. Uh, but as I said, a lot of the investors, in fact, I think all of the investors were quite happy with the fact that they um, they got quite a nice tax reduction uh, from it. So they actually benefited it benefited from it in the long run anyway. Um, which is nice for them. <laughs> so. uh, for listeners, I can't remember exactly what was said here, but I allude to the fact that it must be difficult to create something you want to see perform well and something that you're happy with, but have the people that are backing you up also be okay with the failings simply because of that monetary gain. Yeah. Uh, I think what you, what you mentioned there is sort of like quite a... A dangerous concept the idea of me releasing what i was happy with um because that's how that's how this whole thing started was me wanting to make a game that i i would like um and that sort of carried on where i, I was never an arsehole to the staff but when it came to sort of creator creative ideas i sort of employed people that were quite happy just to do the job that they were given um so they weren't they weren't sycophants and they weren't yes men they just sort of didn't care like which what why would they like they're they're there for the money it's not like oh we're a family kind of company like we all got on really well we play games with each other all the time 
Um, and a lot of us still talk to each other to this day, but to them it was a job. And um, I, I fully respect that. And so at the end of the day, like I, they, they didn't really care so long as they were getting paid. And um, I was sort of stroking my own ego quite a lot, thinking like, oh, this is exactly how I pictured it, rather than at any point asking people that weren't you know connected to it like what they thought about it um and so there, there is that danger when you sort of try to follow your own vision that you sort of just follow down this rabbit hole if you've got like blinkers on and you just follow one direction you have no idea if you're like running towards catastrophe or not um which which i think was one of the main failings especially when it came to like the midpoint of the plot and the big heads and things like that and you know, me not working on, like, getting a summarised um, summarized elevator pitch for it. Um, yeah, I, I, take, I take all responsibility for the failings of it on, my, on myself, because at the end of the day, I was the one managing it. And when everything goes tit sideways, the person that runs the show is the one responsible. I tried to access the website for the studio, and it doesn't seem to be accurate. That may be an accident. I might, I might have just forgotten that. It looks like it redirects to a Chinese holding company site. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the funniest things was when someone reached out to me and said, oh, you just got an amazing review, like a five-star review from some Chinese website. And so I went and checked it out. It's a fucking torrenting, like a pirating website. <laughs> it's the funniest fucking thing. <laughs> I mean, fair enough, like... If they are, I'm glad they, I'm glad they liked it. <laughs> um, I think because we we're changing the the company the company name. Um, so basically, when we set up the company, someone who uh, was so there was you know the game production side, but there's also the business side, and I was the only like a common denominator between the two. So like nobody that worked on the development of the game um, ever interacted with anyone on the business side. And uh, one of the people that was brought on uh, was involved in setting up all the, um, you know, the shares and getting set up with the different um, share schemes that we have in the UK. And he made a complete fucking mess of it. An absolute, absolute mess. It cost, it cost us a lot of money. Like we're talking about 20 to 30,000 um, pounds, which is like 10% of our budget. Um, and so I decided when we re-release this game, I'll just do it from a new company that I'm in control of. Um, the shares still carry over, so anyone that invests in still gets their stuff, but um, that way it all comes from there. Um, and so it's just straight up in complete control. Um, and so that might be the case that I just sort of forgot about Team Woodstock, because I sort of assumed no one would look at it anyway um, at this point. And so when the re-release came, um, then it would be pointed to a different company. Now, the game didn't begin life as Wood Salt. Instead, it was known as Sonder, correct? Mm-hmm. You have done your research. I tried to find a reason for the name change. I couldn't find any. Is there any reason why Sonder didn't stay Sonder? So, yeah, so Sonder um, came from this really pretentious guy on Tumblr who um, made a blog called, I think it was like the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows. And if there was ever moments where I thought that I was descending too deep into my own arsehole, I just reminded myself of that guy. I was like, no, I'm doing alright. Um, but Sonda basically refers to the idea that, or the realisation that every other person in the world um, has the same level of intricacy in their life. They have all these uh, stories just like you. Um, and that, that was the basic, um, basic gist. And of course, because... Um, the, the game was based around the idea that the main character, MC, was sort of like a blank slate, and I was trying to turn the whole thing on its head that while you play a guy literally written shorthand, uh, like in the original script, his name was just MC for main character. Um, and so the whole idea was that he, he's a blank slate. He's supposed to be like the most generic person and it's actually the effects of everyone else in the world around that actually has an effect. So that was sort of the idea to sort of, um, you know, subvert expectations, I guess. Um, 
But we, we trademark the name Sonder um, for you specifically in video games. Um, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to try and trademark it for everything. That'd be a dick move, but we wanted to protect it because obviously we're putting money into it. We're going to release under this. Um, and then about six months after I trademarked it, um, I saw a game that was released on Steam that was called Sonder. And it was made in Moldova, I believe. And Moldova isn't technically part of the European Union, which is where the trademark was registered, like the EU and the UK and you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, however, they were selling the game in those places. Um, so the people on the business side um, of the company were saying, well, we should sue them and get them to take it down. Um, and then I looked at this company, I was like, they're just like us. And really, I it's just a bad look. Yeah, we own the trademark, but am I really going to be that much of an arsehole and say, hey, I'm going to sue you unless you change your name? Like, that's not how I like to uh, proceed. Um, but yeah, we, we did have a, a legal right. Uh, but even like even if you ignore all like the sort of ethics and morality or I, I suppose it's not even that it's, it's a weird gray area because we would be within our rights to do so it's more just like personally on my level I, I didn't really want to do it but if you even look at this on a pure logistics point of view the effort of taking these people to court and fighting them over this compared to the efforts to just sit down with some of your writers and come up with another name is so fucking out of whack um, so I emailed the guys um, who uh, released the game and I told them that I own the copyright for it um, to release a game um, but they can use this email as um, confirmation that you know myself being the CEO of this company grant you permission to publish your game under this title um, just to like prevent anything like that in the future so in the end I just said to them go ahead and publish it you didn't realize um, you know, you probably should have done some research, but hey, like, I've I've messed up more times than I can imagine as well, so I get it, so go ahead. Um, but Wood Salt, um, actually is a lot more close to home, and I'm actually glad the name changed to Wood Salt. Um, for, I like, people seem to find it more interesting than Sonder anyway. Like, everyone's curious about what Wood Salt is. And as you play the game, I think it only mentions it once, what Wood Salt is. Um... It's, it's not it's not a huge plot point or anything like that. It's more an Easter egg. Um, but I grew up in a village called Saltwood. And it is, while the, the name itself is just, you know, a word swap of the two, there is a deeper meaning to that. Because Saltwood was, um, uh, well, I suppose at the time, like we're talking like a millennia ago, um, or millennium ago, sorry, as people keep correcting me, um, was a small village um, on the top of a hill near the coast in England and um, the sea would come up to there but the wood and I guess forest is quite widespread um, the wood that grew there sort of thrived with the ocean water even though they are freshwater plants mostly like you wouldn't expect to see this kind of woodland in an area and so it's called salt wood uh, because the woods were growing out of like salt water now i think probably if you actually looked into the science of it that's all bullshit and it just so happened to be fresh water nearby and no the geographic location was pure coincidence however that's where the name came from and it sort of became synonymous with the idea of life thriving where it shouldn't and so with that the idea of wood salt was there with them being on another planet after escaping um and being on a complete barren thing but still getting to the point if, you, if uh, when you play the game, if you go read the books, you can kind of see um, like journal entries from the initial start and what they had to do, but how um, it was, you know, pulling a bit of a DJ Khaled suffering from success, like they sort of <laughs> grew too much, uh, but they were thriving where they shouldn't be. And so the name became more applicable uh, in that way. Now on your Facebook page, there were a lot of devlogs posted maybe not a lot there were maybe two or three um they were posted to your youtube and they're no longer available uh is there any reason why those little pieces of your development history are no longer around it was painful to watch yeah 
Um, I I went into it with the best of intentions, and as I said, I was never directly or ever intentionally bad to anyone that worked for me, but decisions and choices I made did unfortunately put people in uh, bad, bad situations that I wasn't aware of. And that was going on at sort of like a similar time as those devlogs were starting and continue to go on. And sort of watching me talk like with hope about all these things and then knowing sort of that they're all fine now, but knowing what was to sort of befall some of the people that worked on it. Um, yeah, it, I, I, guess, I guess it was guilt, really, as I, 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 I sort of looked at that person and I was like, you seem so full of hope. You think that you're doing the right thing and you think that you're, you know, hot shit. But you, you have no idea of what your actions are about to do for certain people. And I would convince, well, I, I didn't say I would convince myself. Like, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not intentionally hard on myself, but I try to be honest. And, you know, there was times where um, one, our, our concept artist, um, she emailed, oh no, she messaged me on Discord saying, just to let you know, um, I'm going to have my wisdom teeth taken out tomorrow, but I'll be back to work the day after that. I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? No, take the week off. And like, I used, like paid her an extra week up front. And I was like, get yourself sorted out. Like, don't worry about it. Um, and so there was stuff like that where I look back and said, no, I'm, you know, I'm not an arsehole. But there were things that I was overlooking. And one of the things that I hadn't considered is that some people who were sort of really desperate for work and desperate for the job and relied on it would do what I tell them without question, regardless of how much pressure it put onto them. And I never wanted anyone to crunch. I, again, like, crunch is a failing of management. However, the ramifications land on the people underneath them. The people that are responsible don't get punished. Um, and so, you know, basically if a company ever has to go to crunch, you fire their project managers immediately because they're the ones that fucked up. Um, and I didn't realize I was asking this guy to do stuff and he, he never told me, um, that he was struggling with it, but I could have noticed in retrospect, I should have noticed the guy ended up in hospital. He had like a nervous breakdown because he was staying up like 20 hours um, just to work on it and it was this dude who lived in Mexico um, who started out as a 3D artist and then took on the 3D artist and the programming role and I was paying him quite well especially for where he lived and um, I say quite well I mean we're an indie company but I was paying him around £30,000 a year and he lived in like rural Mexico I believe um, and from what I could gather like the job opportunity for his concept was so good that he didn't want to like rock the boat at all. He just wanted to get on with it and eventually just drove himself to breaking point um, to the point where he like told me that he couldn't work anymore while he was in hospital. I was like, shit. And you know, so bad was his experience that about six months later, I asked if he wanted some more work, but obviously we like scheduled the hours. And even though he wasn't working at the time, he turned it down because he had a bad experience like with the company. Um, I was like, yeah, I just absolutely fucked someone over through sheer ignorance. And the person that did that was the person in those devlog videos. And I just look at that person. I watched those videos like a month or so ago. I was just like, ah, oh, what a dick. <laughs> like, even if it's unintentional, like, your your actions have consequences. Yeah, you hear stories of crunch still to this day. It's It's obviously been a problem in the industry for a long time. I will say it's refreshing to have someone own up to it, though, despite the, you know, intentions behind it. Yeah, it, it's, it's taken me a while to sort of, like, forgive myself for it was such an odd concept because i'm not really the one that should be offering myself forgiveness but out of respect i i never contacted him again i wished him well but i just left him alone because it sort of seemed like just m my mere presence or reminding was difficult for him and you know like 
how I feel is the guilt is my burden. And me messaging him is just me trying to alleviate my own guilt by putting it onto someone that is the victim. Um, which is completely fucked. Uh, but I have sort of like just checked on him like on LinkedIn and stuff, just watched from afar. And he's doing like he's doing quite well from what I can tell. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm happy that I haven't caused any like lasting damage. This, this was around like four years ago. Um, but still, I... I I think about them fairly often, especially like when I'm working on the game, because I taught myself how to use um, Unity and do some 3D modeling to help out when I could. Um, and so when I'm going through and I see some of the older code, I recognize that it's his code um, and like some of his models as well. And so I think about them fairly often. Um, yeah, and as I said, I think that, that tied in with the video, I was just looking at that, just speaking about all these grand ideas I had. I was like, you fucking idiot. <laughs> okay, so we've perhaps unintentionally covered some of the more negative experiences you had while making this game, but it can't all be negative, right? What uh, what kind of positives have you taken away from the experience? No, it's not all negative. That will be disingenuous to say. I mean, you know, I'm still in it. I'm still working on it. A lot of people put their blood, sweat, and tears into it, and a lot of people um, that I didn't deserve to have work with me, you know, better people than me, like, put in a lot of their time to work on it. And because of that, I believe that I have a responsibility to make sure that their work gets seen in a better light than the one I directed it in. Um, I think this definitely made me not only a much better project manager because, you know, you, you can study and you can succeed, but a lot of times you have to really fail to understand how to avoid things. I just wish my failures only affected me rather than other people. Um, but it's made me much better at my job since then. So I'm still working on uh, wood salt in the background. Um, but it's made me... I have got a much keener eye for what people are like thinking and working on when they're not quite so open talking about what's going on. I'm a much... I have a much keener eye for sort of identifying um, certain things. Um, and, you know, I, I had a lot of good experiences out of it. Like, I went to Korea, I went to um, lots of different places in America. Um, I went to E3, which is dog shit, but I still went. Um, you know, it's... I, I like the story as well. There are moments of it that I still find genuinely quite funny. Um, especially when I'm playing the game and I can see who wrote what, what part. So, well, the story and about 50% of the script is my own. Um, there are two other writers and editors that came in um, to help with some of the different characters. And it's still some of the stuff still makes me laugh. And there, there might be a chance that I, I only find the game funny, even when it's meant to be funny. There may be a chance that only I find it funny because I know sort of the context behind it. Especially that there's loads of jokes in there that maybe about five people will get. <laughs> because they're just such like inside jokes, either to development or the Discord. Um... Like, I remember when we were doing testing, we brought some people in um, that, like, saw the trailer and went on uh, the Reddit threads and uh, jumped in and joined. Um, some of the shit they said I found really funny. Um, so I just slipped that into the game for them to find. Um, someone posted a picture of his gran randomly and asked if we could make it, like, a Discord, um, like, emo emoji thing. So I did that, but I also hid her in the game as well. <laughs> um... So yeah, there, there's uh, I had I had a lot of fun with it, um, and it, creatively it was a lot of fun as well because it's sort of like a playground thing. Because once I learned how to do certain things and I learned how to add stuff to the game without completely unraveling everything the programmer had put in so carefully, um, I hid. There there is a lot of stuff in the game that no one has ever seen, um, and you know that's. That's been hit relatively well. I'm sure, like, if anyone ever took the time to data mine, they'd probably work it out. But, um, yeah, they're, they're sort of, like, completely, like, hidden chapters and hidden rooms with unique assets in there. Um, some of them a lot darker than others. Um, but, yeah, I, I think there, there was this sort of sweet spot where it was just, like, some absolute creative clusterfuck in like the best way like it may not have been fantastic for like the sales of the game but for the people involved in it like everyone was enjoying themselves 
um, for a while. And we were all like writing a bunch of really fun stuff, like the idea of, um, I'm not sure if you counted yet, but Pugsy, the, um, so Spaceman Kim, and he's got a little... Uh, I've seen reference to him in my research, yep. I haven't found him in the game yet. Uh, he's one of the side plots. He's probably one of my favorite side plots as well. But um, Pugsy has a space helmet, even though uh, Pugsy can breathe outside. Um, so why does Pugsy have a space helmet? And it's because like, it looks funny, and that's the whole reason behind it. <laughs> there's just lo there's just loads of stupid stuff like all the there's like I think there's like twenty Easter egg endings you can get in the game as well, just from doing stupid stuff. Like if you run in front of a moving car five times without leaving the level, the game ends and you get an ending cutscene. Like explain that MC was run over by a car and died. Um, it's just we we just ended up having like loads of fun with it because we thought that one of our favorite things to do when playing games was like accidentally discovering Easter eggs like back before you had the internet where you could just research this all. Like we wanted to throw so much shit in there that you're bound to find some by accident just by playing anyway. We sort of wanted to give people that level of excitement to, uh, yeah, to do it for themselves without them having to like seek out and look for it. Okay, can can we uh, can, can we talk briefly about the PC gamer kerfuffle? Oh my god! <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> So you were quoted as saying you wanted to make a game like Persona 4 Golden minus the quote-unquote grindy nonsense, which in my opinion is about the most pedestrian criticism one can levy at that game. But at the time, that quote blew up quite a bit. Now, the main issue was that the quote was used as the article's byline with no additional context provided. Now, you've since provided more context. But how do you feel about that situation now? And do you think it had any effect on how the game performed sales-wise? Uh, so there are, as always, multiple sides to how I feel about that. Number one, I, I, I don't go on Twitter. Um, I, I've always, I, I pop on there every now and then. Um, like we're talking like once every six months. Um, just to see if I've got any messages or anything, and then to maybe just to send something to Elon Musk to wind him up, because he clearly reads everything. I just find that idea quite funny. <laughs> Usually not even about anything that he's doing, just a stupid comment, just a waste of his time, because that's how petty I can be. Um, so, number one, PC gamer, I think, wh whoever did that, did it deliberately. And I have a lot of issues with large um, journalistic outlets for video games because they are driven purely by clicks as opposed to people like independents that are like Patreon and um, sponsors. And I think a PC gamer deliberately body bagged us um, in order to sort of drive some attention. So number one, fuck PC gamer. Uh, I say that right now. That's such a cunt move. And they know it is. They know exactly what they did. They can put their hands up and they can claim that it wasn't deliberate, but they were lying. They were lying. They might they might say they did it because it was a small game and they wanted to get whatever whatever the reasons they come up with, it was a deliberate move to stoke people's annoyance. To try and get um what's it called? when people respond to stuff you put out online. Engagement, that's the one. Uh, yeah, they're just trying to get engagement. So ultimately they did two things. So obviously I'm, I was very pissed off with them at the time because I was like, what the fuck? Like I'm just some guy and I've got a group of people that have been working really hard on that. And you just take one line basically out of, I wouldn't say out of context in terms of the text, but out of sort of um, it, the the whole website was clearly sarcastic and tongue in cheek. Like the majority of the website was basically me just like joking about ourselves and things like that. So when you actually read the whole passage, like you might not find it funny, but it clearly is not meant like seriously at all. Um, 
and that that was that was incredibly frustrating to like see that they did that like just to us because uh, i can i can take care of myself like you know people people can say what they want about me and i don't particularly care but as i said there were lots of people including like the person that ended up in hospital and other people that like really helped out with the game and worked really hard on it and then this pc gamer just decides to do this like that's what's the focus is like is sort of what i was saying with my own even if it's unintentional it still has um still has negative effects what they did was intentional and it did have effects on people so you know they should honestly fuck off and die and you can put that in there whoever wrote that shit knew exactly what they were doing and they are a piece of shit for that however the way people responded to it i get it because not only did that quote not only was that quote uh, meant to show us in a bad light it was also deliberately selected in order to upset people who are fond of Persona and fond of that thing. And for a lot of people, things like, you know, anime and, you know, these kind of JRPGs and such sorts of games, like, there, there, there is a the, the Venn diagram of, you know, people that are shy and, you know, quiet and unsure about themselves and introverted and, you know, the people that like anime and these sort of things. Like the Venn diagram, there's a huge crossover over that. And so people put a lot of their own personality and their own feelings into that, especially with, you know, Persona 4 is about such a person who then, like, gets lots of friends and blah, blah, blah and people can relate to it. Um... And so PC Gamer decided to weaponize us to upset those people that hold these things dear. And then they got to step back and put their hands up as this whole fucking shitstorm kicked off with them coming at me. So PC Gamer basically took something that I said out of the source of um, environmental context and did it to upset and stoke the flames of a bunch of people. So I don't actually hold any real ill will towards the people that were upset um, with that towards us. Um, because I, I can't think of anything right now that I hold in such high regard that, you know, it would, well, trigger me, I guess is the appropriate word. But I'm sure there is something out there that would upset me in that way. And... You know, it was, it was an emotional reaction. Um, uh, I mean, tw Twitter's an absolute quagmire anyway. And a lot of these people come on there and they're surrounded by anger and belligerence just being on that platform. And they react in kind. So for someone like me who doesn't really go on there because I try to keep that sort of negativity out of my life. Because um, I, I didn't know until someone um, pointed it out to me. I was like, oh, George, you should probably check out Twitter. I was like... That sentence has literally never been said to me. Yeah, I'm sure you were like, well, this can't be good. Yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, this fucking hell, what have I done now? And it's always, what have I done now? Um, yeah, and so when I saw that, so yeah, uh, again, like that, that is, there are so many things with my experience of um, developing and running my own uh, game studio that. I will put my hands up and say entirely my fault. That one, PC Gamer, again, can go collectively fuck themselves into the ground. Well, there's certainly no way to uh, misconstrue that thought. It's really funny. It is, it is funny. That's the thing. All of this is funny looking back on it. It is because it's so, it's so meaningless because essentially... 140 characters or something like that went out and then for a period of 12 to 24 hours a bunch of people got pissed off it was 24 hours in the the world of things that no one really gives a shit about like if you take a step back and look at it it doesn't matter but at the time like being in the epicenter of that was sort of just a bit like if i could kick that guy square in the face legally i would George, what's next for you and Team Woodsalt? Yeah, so the company has been rebranded to Berry Edmund. Um, so my middle name is Edmund, my last name is Berry. Um, 
but I changed B E R R Y to B U R Y because emo never dies. Um, and so the company's been rebranded to that. Um, so the Wood Salt will it'll probably be renamed um, to. I don't, I don't know. I quite like Wood Salt. I haven't, I haven't fully decided yet. It depends if another name uh, pops up um, into into my mind uh, that's as as suitable. Um, but yeah, so the people that worked on it were all still in contact. Um, so you know the the programmer, he's still there. Um, we talk maybe about once a month, and he's still very happy to keep working with me. Um, and <laughs> me and the sound guy are really good friends, but I'll just do the sound myself next time because, you know, I've got a lot of recording equipment. Um, I've got a lot of uh, producer friends that um, are like professionals in it. So I'll probably write the music and then I'll give the music to them. So please make this not shit. Um, but yeah, so we, we actually have had about five other games all written within universe that um continue and precede the story since the very beginning so a lot of the stuff that's referenced in wood salt um was actually planned to be directly referenced in games like three four down the line um so you know we've got this like um what i'll see if i can remember it so i know it's supposed to start with um a story called jack of all then fierce, then fierce epilogue, um, and then wood salt, and then hello spaceman, and then hillcrest, um, and then there's another one that I can't remember the fucking name of. Oh no, epilogue was that one, and then there was um, wood salt prologue had a different name. I can't remember at the moment. Um, Oh, Exodus. That's it. So Jack, Jack of all um, basically explains sort of the creation of the company that ended up creating a certain person that's in Wood Salt. Um, and that's referenced. Um, Fierce then basically surrounds the creation of said being. And that's uh, an Fierce epilogue basically focuses upon that being's ascension to what many would consider a god which then leads on to um, wood salt exodus which is the fall of earth and then you get wood salt which also happens um, at the exact same time kind of we actually planned for, we um, got a um, uh, astrophysicist to help us out plan it out so it sort of happens alongside hillcrest um, and Hello Spaceman, they all happen at the exact same time, except for the time dilation that's involved with the jumping of the carriers, um, which then leads on to uh, Epilogue, which is the end where um, essentially God versus God, what we consider to be God in our world, basically comes down to fight the God that has been created, and then the whole ending of the entire thing, which then leads to a book that I'm writing called Satellite. So there's obviously no shortage of ideas for content, well, in theory, potentially. I would love to do it, whether it's just like books or graphic novels or games. Um, I think some of them would work quite well just as visual novels, um, some as graphic novels. Um, some I would love just to make as full action games. Um, something like Near Automata would be fantastic. Um, especially as Near Automata didn't actually have like a massive budget, so it's actually somewhat achievable if we could get like a game or two that were successful. Now, have any of those plans been set into motion? So we can't... I, I'm struggling to get the money in. So what I'm doing instead is basically offering up large chunks of my share in the company. And the basic way of saying is, look, we have this game. It is essentially finished. But we want to adjust and change some things. So these people that, you know, we're going to offer and say, you're not coming to work in from a project at the very beginning. You're going to come in to work on a project to basically polish it up. And while we can't pay you up front now, we're hoping that I can offer you, you know, dividends from, you know, of a percentage that we'll discuss that you're happy with. And you know that the game is already technically in a releasable state. So the game is already ready to be released. So there's not going to be a situation unless somehow we manage to blow the entire thing up that we're going to end ourselves in a position where we can't sell anything. 
Um, so that that's where I'm going at now, because my position is I want to get the game out, regardless of if I personally make any money from it or not. Um, and for that, I'm willing to like just sell all my own shares to make that happen. So I prob I personally won't make any money from it, but people involved like we've even there's like ten percent of the shares that I reserve to pay out people that worked on the game. Um, even like people that haven't touched it for about four years, um, they get a payout from it. So if if that's how it goes, then I'll basically everyone but me <laughs> gets money from it, which will be <laughs> quite a uh, quite poetic uh, in a way. But I, I'm 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 quite happy to do that, honestly. You know, and that that just illustrates what you've talked about since the moment you started this passion project. You just want the best version of what everyone set out to create. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, it, it has been a passion project of mine, and as a result of it being my passion, that I'm in a unique position where I'm willing to sacrifice a lot in order to have it have it released. Whereas other people don't have that connection to it. As I said, like, you know, the people that worked on it, they did it as a job, and I respect that. Like, you know, what what brings you to work every morning? Money, so I can pay my bills. Fair enough. And that's just a fact of life, you know? That's what makes a company a company, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, why would they give a shit about my story? Like, there's, there's millions upon millions of people out there that have, like, what they consider great ideas that are important to them, but they're not important to anyone else, and that's okay. Like, I don't expect people to, like, what, what's so special about my story, <laughs> you know? Like, why, why would they give a shit about that? Well, George, that's about all the questions I have for you. Do you have anything else that you want to add? Hmm... I suppose to people that want to create their own games, I would probably say that the game, the game that you dream up, your dream game that's making you want to go into game development, keep that dream, but shelf it. Don't make that your first project. I'm not telling you to get rid of it forever. I'm telling you that if it's really that important to you, work on something smaller first and work your way up to it because you are going to run a very large risk with a very high probability of failure that it's going to blow up in your face and that dream is for nothing. Um, start with something manageable and build up to it. doesn't have to be like, you know, um, a, uh, you know, a casual mobile game that's, you know, a dime a dozen, but something that you'd be interested in, but that's at a much smaller level. Um, that would probably be my key. Like, I definitely tried to sprint before I could crawl. And I think that was one of the main failings. Um, so yeah, don't give up on your dreams. Work towards your dreams. Like, they don't just appear. Um, and just because you think they're in reach and you can grab them, it might not be the best idea for you to do that. Like, take your time. Make it, make it count. I think that's solid advice. And not just for game devs. I think anyone who puts their creative self out there can save themselves a lot of heartache by taking that approach. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, I suppose so. And I mean, I think it's, it's advice that's been around for a long time, just phrased many, many, many different ways. And a lot of people ignore that because, you know, everyone sort of has to make their own mistakes first. Uh, well, if you, want, if you want to ignore what I'm saying, you reckon you could do it? Just maybe do it on your, you know, second favorite dream rather than your big dream. Because you will fuck it up. <laughs> like, that's a guarantee. So at least keep your big dream, you know, safe for the lessons that you learned. Thank you again for your time, George. Do you have any questions for me? Um, no, not really. I mean, I suppose, I suppose once um, the sort of redux has a more solid thing, I'll hit you up and um, let you know about it. Um, um, I probably won't be telling PC Gamer about it. <laughs> IGN, IGN and GameSpot were cool. No, they were fine. Thank you, George. And thank you all for listening to this conversation with George Berry, creator of Wood Salt.